All right, so please turn your monitor sideways. Kind of a light week in terms of lecture. Uh, I don't know, I, I hit you guys pretty hard the first half, first three-fourths of the semester, and then uh, I ease off, and that's by design. And um, that's just because a lot of classes do it the exact opposite. They're a little bit light at the beginning, and then they get heavier towards the end. And so I like to sort of give you a little balance on your schedule. Um, so today, this week's a little lighter. We still have some really great things left, which we're going to learn about. So we're going to learn about databases one week and talk about databases and, and how they work and data storage and what they are and the role they play. We'll talk about uh, systems, uh, systems analysis and systems design life cycle. And so systems thinking is this, uh, you know, approach to looking at a system and how do we make it better? How do we you know, innovate? Right? And so uh, an example of a system would be anything. Like you have a system when you get up in the morning. How do you like that? An example of a system would be anything. I don't think that's quite precise enough. <laughs> There's probably things which aren't systems. A rock is not a system. The rock has a system, systems that it uses for decomposition, right? It has a certain process it goes through to decompose or whatever. Um, but anyhow, a system, you know, you have a system when you wake up in the morning, right? Like, okay, this is how I get ready for my day. And you can kind of mentally picture that system. Or you have a system for getting to school. And you can mentally picture that one. And there might be points of frustration for you in that system, right? Like, Maybe finding parking on campus is a point of frustration, or maybe you know the city buses are a point of frustration. And so when you find points of frustration, that's like screaming uh, uh, opportunity for innovation. Because if you're frustrated, other people are probably frustrated. So how can I innovate to create some new system? Because this system is frustrating me. How can I make a new system and do something cool, right? Like, and you can see that you know like large tech companies, you know, that's that's what they do, right? They're like, check out, you know, your phone now. It gives you directions. How cool is that? It figures out the optimal path. I, a lot of, maybe you guys fall into this category, a lot of young people these days don't know how to function without their phone. <laughs> They're like, I don't know how to get there. How do I get there if I don't have my phone, <laughs> right? Yeah, you know, I mean, obviously, like, if you're, I mean, I, I, I hit that, too, when I'm in foreign cities. I'm like, I just, like, I don't know, what's my next turn left, right? I just follow the phone, man. They can drive me straight to, like, some, you know, uh, bad part of town and into a warehouse, and then I'd get mugged if somebody, like, hacked it or something. So we have databases. We have systems analysis. We have programming. We'll talk about programming. We, uh, we'll talk about e-waste. Right? What do we do with all? What happens to all these electronic devices? They only last a couple of years, three, four, five years at most. I mean, think about how long you've had your phone. Right? Chances are it's less than three years, and and if it's at three years, you're probably thinking about getting a new one. So what happens to all that waste? What do we do with it? Um, and then ergonomics. So how do we use computers safely? What are the risks associated with computers, like myopia, getting nearsighted because you're staring at something up close? or carpal tunnel syndrome, protecting ourselves from carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, and uh, usually uh, I like to talk about, you know, some of the technology and warfare. I don't know. So sometimes, sometime I might talk about that. But anyhow, that's some of the stuff that we have coming up. And we're at week nine, so we're officially halfway through the semester. And you guys have a lot of work, right? So you, uh, you have a lot of, uh, a lot of assignments. Um, so you should be week nine, you know, in Blackboard, right? Uh, you should be through all these assignments, and you should be doing your access project, and then also, uh, you know, programming and a paper covering week seven through nine. So those three things right there. And then in my IT lab, uh, dang, this always takes a minute to click through to all this stuff. I should make, pause this video so the people on all right, so uh, if we're in week nine, this is week one, this is week, you know, two, three, four, and five, right? And then uh, here is six, seven, eight, nine. So we're at the last assessment in Excel. So you should be through the last assessment in, assessment in Excel, all right? And your project here next <coughs> week will be access in, uh, oh, and then you also need to do your quiz chapter nine, right? Next week will be access um, uh, for, you know, my IT lab will be starting in on access. But this week you have a project, which is for access. And so this, this video right here will give you everything you need to know. And it's actually a good place to start. Access is a database. 
And so it's a crappy little database that you would never use for anything that is, you know, of any significance or scale. It's fine for a small business, you know, but um, but uh, it, and it's a good thing for introducing you to databases. But um, but that little video right there will sort of show you how you know databases work and give you a really good introduction to databases. All right. Um, and maybe we'll take a look at that today, just to sort of preface that assignment. We'll take a look at like how databases work. So, before we you know uh, do anything else, uh, I thought it just might be interesting if you guys have any questions or in, on anything related to technology, right? Like, hey, I'm kind of curious about this from what I've been reading in the textbook, you know, or you know, I'm shopping for a computer and I'm still a little bit unsure what these terms are when I'm looking at the different systems. Um, so does anybody have any Q crickets? Any questions? Or you're thinking about like, hey, I'm kind of interested. I like technology. I'm interested in career. Todd, what are your thoughts on this? None? You want me to provide all the content. Just keep going, huh? Dang it. Well, I guess that's why they give me a paycheck. McDonald's coffee's all right. Like, they got the expensive coffee. But if you just get the dollar coffee, that's it's fine, man. Like, I, uh, I, feel, I, feel, I feel the caffeine. <laughs> what else do you need from coffee? They say if you drink coffee, it makes you smarter. I don't know if that's true or not. What's that? Yeah? It's a it's like coconut oil with like fresh grounded coffee beans with um, grass fed butter. And it sharpens your mind. I literally read articles on how it sharpens your mind. I saw on a TV show someone said you know you're eating coffee TV, right? Coconut oil butter. No grass fed butter. Grass fed butter. Grass fed, which is different than it's regular butter. It's really. very different because the cow's only fed just grass. So mm -hmm. Yeah, there's always something that people are selling. And some of it has validity. It's absolutely true. Um, I had some quippy comment, but I don't know where it went. I'm running a little bit sleep deprived. All right, so uh, what, what was my quippy comment? I don't know what my quippy comment was. Um, it's gone. Uh, so week, week, uh, week nine. So last week we talked about privacy and security. And did we talk at all about protecting yourself? We did a little bit, right? You guys remember anything that sort of came up with how do we protect ourselves online or, you know, in, in this digital age? All right, we watched that movie the first week, uh, Disconnect, Disconnected, right? Mm -hmm. Disconnect. And that sort of had some scenarios. So what are your guys' thoughts about protecting yourself? How do you protect yourself? Just sort of review that. I, I use Kapersky for about six years. Kapersky, so you need some antivirus software. Good idea. Do you need antivirus software on a Mac? No. So Unix is a more uh, solid operating system. It's built with stronger security. Everything, every application, every application, every little program that runs on Unix gets put into its own sandbox. And it's hard to break out of that. So sandbox is a technical term, right? Which just means each little piece of software that runs on this computer is going to run in its own contained environment. And it's really hard for it to sort of breach that and go into other areas of your computer. And so I don't run antivirus software on my Mac, and a lot of people have Macs don't because it's a Unix-based operating system. So we got Windows-based operating systems, right? DOS, Windows originated with DOS. And then we also have Unix-based operating systems like Mac or Linux. So, uh, so those are uh, so antivirus software is really important if you're on Windows. Questionable if you're on a Mac, but yeah, that's a great point. How do you protect yourself? Antivirus software. What else? We just got a little chip on our Skyrim card a few months ago. We're getting hit like once or twice a year. You know, people buying beer, 
doing online, uh, making online purchases with their numbers, you know. I don't know how they get it. We got to make the lease every, every year, so we got a little chip on the card now. We have to put the card in the point of sale device. <coughs> Yeah, so credit cards now uh, have, you know, chip-enabled credit cards, right? And so, um, what, are the, what are they? EMV. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know much about that, but, right? A little chip on your card. It's supposed to be more secure. Um, <clears throat> hmm? Military uses them on cards, access cards. ID cards, yeah. Are you in the military? You date military men. Yeah. All right. You like the man in uniform, huh? <laughs> I never was in a uniform, so I never experienced that. <laughs> you know, the security numbers on the back, instead of using that, use the chip to create a unique number for each transaction. Hmm. So if you go to the same store twice, you get like a two unique things going out. That way it's like impossible to copy. Yeah. And use and use right. Yeah, I haven't read about it at all, but. That sounds very feasible. Some sort of uh, encryption hashing or something going on to validate. Um, so uh, credit cards, chips. How do people get your credit card number? You know? Like if you're a hacker, you want to steal credit card numbers, how are you going to steal it? Copy it? When are you going to copy it? Keystrokes, or you give it to a waiter at a restaurant. I'll be right back. The waiter says, goes and takes a photo of it with his his or her phone, right? And then runs your card, and then you know Pat sells the number online, gets five bucks for each number they sell, or you know uh, uses it themselves. So you know we're but the Truth in Lending Act. So there's the Truth in Lending Act, TILA. And the Truth in Lending Act limits your liability with credit cards to $50 or nothing. I can't remember exactly. There's like something. So basically, it just means that it's on the credit card companies if they're going to offer the service to make sure that they're watching their customers, making sure their customers aren't being taken unduly advantage of. And credit card companies will try to take advantage of you. <laughs> Right, but you know that's all part of the game. That's in the rules. But uh, you know, the, so if you ever have credit card fraud or charges show up that you know don't belong to you, all you got to do is call your credit card company. You guys all know that, right? Never buy credit card insurance or protection. Somebody selling that say, "Why do I need it? I thought the Truth in Lending Act covered me on that." They'll be like, "What?" Because they're just a low-wage employee. They've never heard of Truth in Lending Act. <laughs> There's low wage employee <coughs> making phone calls. We never paid, no yeah, you just call your company and they reverse the charges. That's just cost of doing business for them. Hmm? Oh, like debit your yeah. bank? No, that's the bank. No, so if you right. if you debit right. the store. Yeah. Too bad you lost. So I don't know how that works. Seems like debit cards would fall under the Truth in Lending Act, but maybe not. They don't. It doesn't apply to them. All right, so you know another way you could sort of protect your finances because that's what this comes down to is you could sign up at Mint, right, and monitor all of your transactions. So that's highly recommended. Just like every day, I get an email from my bank account. Here's your current balance inside my bank account. I can set flags if a transaction is bigger than this amount. Send me an email. So, you know, I go and I buy something like bought a barbecue this weekend, it's a couple hundred bucks, and I get an email like, hey, you know, you had a, a large expense. Yeah, I know, that was me, right? But, you know, that way if somebody else does it, it's like I immediately have a head up. If somebody's accessing my bank account and I see my balance change, I know that within 24 hours because I'm seeing my balance every day in my bank account. And then Mint, I go in and I look at it, right? So I'm looking at all my accounts, so check that a couple of times a week. You know, so just staying on top of it. They also recommend looking at your credit report. So the credit report is uh, is just there's three agencies which monitor your spending activity, and those three agencies are uh, three credit bureaus. Right, uh, they are TransUnion, Experian, and Equifax. Okay, 
And uh, and so that's the companies that that's their business is just to like I don't know how they get all the data, but and then they put a score on on you and say you're this type of a consumer. You do or you do not repay your obligations. You are you are not good at managing your money. And so um, they give you a free credit report. And so uh, you want the one from. Uh, you know, you want to be careful, right? Experian, that would be good, right? How to get your free annual credit report from Experian, right? So Experian, TransUnion, Equifax, like those are legitimate. You know, if Google's listing them up here, chances are they're pretty legitimate because Google doesn't want to provide you, you know, Google is about giving recommendations. And, you know, if you were like in some foreign country and some dude gave you a recommendation to go down this alley, it turned out to be a really dark alley, really skanky, kind of scary, you're concerned about getting mugged, there's a lot of, you know, unsavory characters standing around in the shadows, you wouldn't take directions from that, that dude again if you ran into him. You'd be like, there's that dude, I'm not asking him, he sent me down the dark alley last time. So Google wants to make sure that, you know, everything they provide you is legit, you know, and that they don't give you a link to something that's going to fleece you. So, you know, the fact that Google, right, you know, puts it up high, probably pretty good. You know, any of these choices would probably be pretty good. Annual credit report, I think I've heard of that, right? But Experian, I definitely know that. So I'd read, like, okay, what's Experian saying? Because they're the source, right? But checking your credit report every year. So managing your finances, that's a big place for anybody being put at risk, right? Because that's what people want. They want money because then they can buy stuff. And so how do they get to your money? Well, if you're watching your money, you know, you're staying on top of it. So that's one of the ways to protect yourself. Antivirus software, right? You know, watching your, your accounts all the time and just kind of keeping tabs on them and just kind of building that system into your life where I'm using Mint, my accounts are all connected, I'm seeing my daily, daily balance, my bank account is, uh, you know, sending me emails if there's a transaction over a certain amount, you know, and just staying on top of it. Knowing the truth in lending acts, so if a, a fraud char a, a charge appears that you're not sure of, you know, taking care of it, right? Uh, so that's the thing again in life, right? Just, you know, getting stuff done. I, I call it, one of the phrases I use to think about that is being on point. You got to stay on point. You got to be alert. You got to be vigilant, right? You got to be watching. You're moving forward. You're, you're focused, right? Staying on point. Just being alert. So, all right. So finances, that's a huge area. And there's a lot of protections already in place that you could use to sort of make sure you're all squared up. How else do we protect ourselves? We've got to be careful, you know, you know, uh, where we do our computing and and what we do at which computers. So public terminals not safe. You don't know what's running on a public terminal. Don't enter your bank password, school computer. No way. You have your flash drive. You've been using your flash drive at school, and you go home. Right? Well, you better scan that flash drive before you open anything up on it. First thing, stick it in, open your antivirus, analyze my flash drive. My friend calls flash drives virus sticks. <laughs> right? So you gotta think about where you're you're doing your, your computing and what you do at which computers. So two-step authentication is another thing that's really good. I think we mentioned this. Right? So Google has two-step auth. Yeah, and that's the thing where you log in and then it, it sends you a code. It's like, you want to steal my account, you got to have both my password and my phone. Because <laughs> you need both those things to get into my account. Because Google's going to send me back a secret number, I'll enter it, and then I'm in. Right? So that's like the real practical stuff of protecting yourself. You also want to be really careful with what information you give out. Because people can steal your identity. Right? They they uh, they steal your you know, and then they could go and get credit cards in in your name and buy cars in your name and I mean it sounds kind of nuts, right? But I went down to get a birth certificate for my daughter. She was born nine weeks ago. Needed a birth certificate for uh, something or another. And so you go down to the city records and you ask for a birth certificate. You know, I say I need a birth certificate for my daughter, and I fill out the information. And, uh, and, and then, you know, uh, and then I pay them like 40 bucks and they give me a birth certificate. I'm like, that's it? You're not going to check my ID or anything? She goes, you signed right there that you, uh, you should be the one getting this and that's under penalty of perjury. So if that's not you, you know, then too. And it's like, wow, dude, it's that easy to get a birth certificate. You could go find out like some, some dude who's dead, right? 
at the cemetery who's about your age, go down there, get a birth certificate. Now you got a birth certificate, what else can you get? Can you go get a driver's license? You need a birth certificate. Guess what? I got one. All right? Cool. Dang, you know I lost my social security card. I got a new address. Dot, 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 right? And then pretty soon you got a new identity. And you're playing James Bond. But the point being, you want to protect your, your, your sensitive data that people use for stealing identities. Social security number, sensitive. Right? Driver's license number, mother's maiden name, that kind of stuff. I was a little surprised how easy it was to get a birth certificate. Like they didn't check ID. I was like, whoa, really? I thought that was some big involved process. So uh, you also want to uh, make sure you have complex passwords. So that your passwords are right, not your daughter's name or your son's name or your dog's name. There's like a thousand most common passwords that when hackers try to crack accounts, they could just run those thousand passwords against the account, see if it lets them in. That's known as a brute force attack, attack, or 10,000 or million, whatever, right, to get in. You want to know one of the most uh, common ways that people are compromised is through social engineering. Like that's one of the best ways to hack. It's not a digital hack. But it's, uh, you know, they, they find some way to finagle information out of you. So those are those phone calls where it's, I'm calling from your bank, right? Or, hey, I'm calling from Microsoft. There's some issues. We need to get them fixed. Can I help you fix your computer? Please sit down. Now please go to this URL. Now please install this. Great, you're all fixed. Thanks for letting me in. <laughs> Give me access. Anybody got one of those calls? Because it sounds kind of fanciful, but... Nobody in here has ever got one of those calls? Yeah, from your bank and you're like, I don't know. So uh, what other ways are are there threats out there? And yeah, what's up, LaDon? Wi-Fi signal address. Yeah, so locking down your Wi-Fi signal, right? And just that, only giving access to people you want to have access. Otherwise, you might get a knock on the door. We're from the FBI, and we're here to ask you why you've been downloading all that child porn. What are you talking about? You don't want to lie. Or you download all those movies, right? And it's like, it wasn't you, it was somebody else who was just piggybacking on your Wi-Fi network was doing an illegal activity, but now it's associated with your, your spot, right? Your house. So, yeah, lock it down. We went through the steps for locking down your Wi-Fi, so that's another really good thing. Any other things jump out to you? So uh, when we talk about access control, you know, like physically securing your, your stuff is another thing to think about. So, hey, where, where, is my, where are my valuables? Where is my technology? I went to Lowe's before I came to class. And then I stopped at McDonald's at Shields and Blackstone. Do you think I left my backpack with my laptop in my car when I went in to get my coffee? No. This is a very nice laptop. I'd be very disappointed if I lost this laptop. It takes a long time to get like all the signatures in a government bureaucracy to sign off on a $3,000 laptop. Right? That's a good requisition. And once you get it, you don't want to have to go through that process again. Because it's going to be a couple years before you get, to get another one. So my laptop comes with me. I'm not leaving it in the car. So that's another thing to think about. Right? And that's another way that people, like corp corporate espionage, I love that phrase, corporate espionage, spies spying for corporations. Like how can I get valuable data from, <coughs> from a corporation and then either use it at my corporation or sell it, right? Corporate espionage. One of the ways that can occur is they'll steal your, your tech. You know, like CEOs, high-profile executives, right, at a conference, then all of a sudden, bam, somebody grabbed the laptop and was running, and then in a car and gone, right, or they just grab your briefcase and they're gone. I don't know how much that happens. It sounds pretty cool. 
my brother-in-law <laughs> used to have a, a piece of software on his computer, and he's done high-tech Silicon Valley stuff. He used to have a piece of software on his computer. If you miss the login three times, it destroys everything on the hard drive. <laughs> right? So, great, you got my computer, get in. Because if you mess up three times, everything on the hard, hard drive has been destroyed. You get none of those secrets. Yeah, it's pretty brutal, right? Like, if you missed your password twice, that's like a do-or-die moment the third time. <laughs> Dang, I hope I get it right this time. Yeah, so the other thing is backing up your information. So if something does happen to your stuff, cool, I got a backup. All right, your house burns down, I got a backup. Don't store your backup at your house because your house burns down, your computer got burned up, so did your backup. All right? You want to somehow store everything that's critical that you'd love to have access to somewhere else. You want to store that somewhere else. So like, you know, just putting up critical files on the cloud, Google Drive, or, you know, I used to burn CDs and bring them and leave them at work with, like, stuff I wouldn't want to lose. Or, you know, probably today stick it on a big flash drive, thumb drive. So backing up. When, when, we, uh, when you're doing authentication, like, how can I validate that this person is who they say they are, there's three things that can get checked. So the first thing is uh, it's who you are, what you have, and, and what you know. Who you are, what you have, what you know. All right? So let's think about it a different way. Uh, is what you, what you know, what you have, who you are. That's a better way. What you know, what you have, who you are. Password's what you know. All right? Uh, credit, uh, ATM card, it's what you have. So to get into my bank account, you need my ATM card and you need my PIN number. What I know and what I have. You need those two things. Right? So, uh, you know, and then the other way we could authenticate people is who they are. So, great, you know the password, you've got the key, now put your thumb here and let's get a, a biometric reading, right? Biometric scanner can scan your thumbprint and see, hey, what's going on? Is that you? And so, great, you entered a password, you had a key, and then you get a thumbprint. We've checked three things. But those are the three things we could check with people. And with biometric measurements, measure their thumbprint, measure their voice, measure how they type, measure how they walk, look at their face, right? Retina scans. Thumbprint's pretty common. iPhones now have the thumbprint deal, which is kind of interesting because thumbprints is so, huh? Some laptops, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, check it out, right? Like, I, iPhone, Apple's gonna have maybe you know a really big database, maybe even bigger than the FBI's database of fingerprints. Whoa, right? Like, oh, fingerprints were left at the crime scene. Let's go over to Apple and see if they can match them. Oh yeah, your weight, huh? So you get have to go have a big meal and get in. Your car doesn't start. What's up? You got to hang out for a while. Have, <laughs> do a little exercise. I'm sorry. You're too fat to drive. <laughs> You've been eating too much. Yeah. It's all patterns. That's amazing. Yeah, so backing stuff up. If you're a company, one of the biggest risks, one of the biggest threats for being breached is your very own employees. Like recently, the United States government got, or I can't remember who, whatever, but some, some, some Chinese hacked somebody in America, and the reason that we got hacked, I think it was the NSA or something, was, was I can't remember, but let me see. Chinese uh, hack, U.S. government uh, employee, right? But it was, uh, I don't know, but it was somebody we'd hired from China. I think it was a company, and, and, uh, and we hired some guy from China, and he just took everything and gave it to the Chinese. <laughs> so that's one of the biggest threats, 
is uh, hiring people and then giving them access. And then they do something which, you know, they, they weren't trustworthy. Edward Snowden, like the NSA is not happy with Edward Snowden. I love, uh, I love this poster of Edward Snowden. Um, they didn't like it when we, Edward Snowden. Let me see if I can find the image. Poster. Save Snowden, save freedom. Um, yeah, anyhow. It's a pretty cool poster. I don't know why it's not easy to find. But it said something like, you know, uh, it's like they don't, they don't like it when, you know, they don't mind us. They don't mind you know, looking at our private information, but when we wanted to look at their information, they're like, hey, wait a minute, that's our information, right? Like Edward Stone took their information. Yeah. So let's, uh, anybody else have any comments about all that? Pretty straightforward, commonsensical stuff, but maybe also things you hadn't thought about before. Good to think about. Um, so employees, biggest security risk for companies. Uh, you know, there's different things that are out there, right? Like, I don't know, scams, spoofing, phishing, auction frauds. And so that's a, you know, is, uh, is like phishing. They're sending you an email and uh, it's not actually from PayPal. So you should never click a link in an email because it could take you to a spoofed website. That's less true today. You know, identity theft, right? You know, we already talked about that. You should shred credit card applications and that kind of stuff that comes to your house so they just don't end up at the dump where somebody could grab them. You want to use secure passwords, you know? So your password should be random sequence of numbers. It should be long. I think there's software for managing passwords. I've never used it, but uh, a guy who I really respect, really smart programmer, uses one and just creates totally random passwords and then you just copy them. So you just have to remember one password to get into your vault and then it has all your other passwords. Um, we talked about hacking a little bit, hacking methods. Um, you guys interested in any more on hacking? Like social engineering is a big hack one, right? Just actually getting somebody to give information up. Do you know how there's a, there's a virus that was released and it's called the Stuxnet virus and uh, 60 Minutes did a deal on it, which is really cool. And Stuxnet, you know, was a computer warm, op uh, opens a new era of warfare. Whoa. Right? Digital warfare. Like, how cool is that? And so Iran was, like, building a nuclear energy program, but we're pretty concerned that they're building nuclear, maybe working towards building nuclear bombs. And so we're like, uh, you know, nobody knows who put this virus, this computer virus, into the Iranian Iranian uranium processing facility, right, where they process uranium to make nuclear bombs. Nobody knows, you know, who that virus came from, but the only people that, you know, are probable suspects are us and Israel. <laughs> so I think, you know, most people speculate that it's the United States and Israel. And uh, a virus got into a secure facility, and, uh, and it would take the centrifuges and run them too fast so they would break. And it, they wouldn't process the uranium correctly, but it would show on the com on the computers which monitor the centrifuges everything's running fine. <laughs> so the engineers are like, "What? Everything's fine. We don't know why they're breaking, but they were spinning too fast." And so they hired a German security firm to come in and what's going on. And the security firm found the virus, and then the security firm released the virus into the wild. They said, "Hey, we found this virus. Anybody know anything about it?" And now everybody has access to this virus, which lets you target Siemens controllers, which are the controllers for all major industrial applications, like in dams, nuclear, uh, you know, nuclear um, energy plants, um, you know, electrical, like all these things are Siemens controllers. Um, 
But each one has to be really unique and specific. Anyhow, it's just really interesting. And the way they got the virus in to uh, the secure facility was they just put it on a USB flash drive and then they'd leave the flash drives in places where the engineers who worked at the facility would frequent. And so, you know, you're an engineer, you stop for coffee in the morning and there's like a 32 gigabyte flash drive. And it's like, you, wow, cool. You know, I found a 32 gigabyte flash drive and you, you know, it's got pictures of random people on it. You're like, whatever, delete those pictures. I'm never going to find these people. I got a new flash drive. But secretly in, embedded in the flash drive is this virus. And then you take it to work and plug it in, and the virus gets into the system. So antivirus software is only as good as the antivirus software, right? You can still defeat antivirus software. Antivirus software is looking for patterns. And, you know, if uh, that pattern isn't recognized, then that the virus will get past. And there's, you know, there's common patterns that it looks for. And that's why you update your antivirus software regularly, because as new patterns come out, right? Oh, let's update the software to look for those. So that's what's happening when it's being updated. So pretty interesting video about, you know, how a system got compromised. Um, So that's like one hacking method, right? Like get people to take a flash drive with virus on it. When we were in China, they were given, you know, flash drives really cheap. Stuck it in my computer, didn't work. Reformatted my uh, hard drive, put the operating system back on. <laughs> it's like, I don't know what I just stuck in my computer. It's one of the reasons I like Unix operating systems better. More secure than Windows. Uh, So malware, spyware, viruses, those terms are all pretty much synonymous when you hear those terms. Worm, Trojan horse, it's just malicious code. That's what malware stands for, malicious software, right? It's just malicious code. Malicious, mal, being bad, right? And, um, you know, there's different ones, and the different names meet, sometimes talk about what they do. Like Trojan horse is a piece of software which looks like one thing and does something else. And, um, you know, it's from the myth of the Trojan horse where what the people from Troy gave the people of Athens a big wooden horse as a gift. And then in the middle of the night, all the soldiers came out of the horse and went around cutting everybody's throat as they slept. Right? And so it's like, hey, it looks like a gift, but it's actually, you know, wrapped in that gift is a bunch of bad intent stuff that is there to harm you. So, hey, look, cool little piece of software, it's free. Or, hey, look, I downloaded this software for free. I got Microsoft Office for free from some dude in China. Uh-huh, what else did you get? Do you know? I don't know. Maybe you got something else, right? Do you guys know all this? How many people have not learned anything new yet? Raise your hand if you haven't learned anything new yet. Bye. You got anything new to teach us? No. No. Malware, spyware, viruses, um, Trojan horse, time bomb, set to go off at a certain time. Use software that will go off at a certain time. You know, and then just keeping your family safe, keeping yourself safe, right? We talked about this a little bit, but if you got kids, you want to make sure you monitor their internet activity and, uh, Keep, keep the internet, you know, where they access the internet in a public location so you can see, you know, they aren't able to squirrel away and look at things they shouldn't be looking at. Um, you should be careful about how much media you show them. Uh, TED Talk, Media and Children is a really cool talk about how does media, watching too much TV, baby Einstein videos, how does that impact the development of a psyche? And, uh, the, 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 the spoiler alert, the synopsis of that video here is like your kids shouldn't be watching Baby Einstein nor too much frantic television with a lot of stimulation and quick cuts and jarring music that will help create, uh, you know, not a, a stable, calm, grounded uh, psyche. It creates a more of a risk-taking psyche when they study that and a frantic you know, kind of like the shows are kind of frantic, right? 
So think about what you're showing your kids. Um, they do say that, uh, like, if you want to show your kids TV, like, what's that that old guy who's like, welcome to my neighborhood? Mr. Yeah, Mr. Rogers is like, good. Because, like, not only is it, like, you know, not fast-paced, it's, like, slower paced than real life, right? Like, he goes to a restaurant and, you know, it's like, you know, right? You know, it's just like, now I'm going to sit down at the table. This is a place setting. We have the napkin on the left. And this is the fork that I'll eat with, right? It's just like nice and slow, informative. That's, you know, I, I think I'm going to buy the whole DVD set of Mr. Rogers so my kids have something to watch. You can watch Mr. Rogers. Is your daughter really nine weeks old? Nine weeks old. Congratulations. Thanks, man. Stay up all night to get lucky, and then after that, you stay up all night taking care of the kids. That's how that works out. I have two. Two. How old's the older one? Uh, two, two years in a month. Nice. That's good. Yeah, it's totally together. cool, huh? It's good they'll be at, like close together, dude. Yeah. Yeah, pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> so just a little bit of encryption. I think we've already seen ROT13. We already looked at that. So encryption is just taking a message and jumbling it up so nobody else can read it. And, um, you know, when you see HTTPS, uh, everything I send is going to be jumbled up and sent across the open network, the open internet. And then they'll receive it and unjumble it. And then they'll jumble it up and send it back. And I'll receive it and unjumble it. And that happens all behind the scenes. So if you intercepted a transmission, it might look like this, right? But then when you unencrypt it, it'll be legible. And so ROT13 is just rotate 13 characters. It's basic encryption. So if I rotate 13 from H, it becomes U. So if I sent this message, right, just basic encryption, you could then rotate back and figure out what I was trying to convey. Caesar did that, sending messages. He did some sort of basic encryption like that. So if people intercepted it, they'd have to know how to unencrypt it. It's, I think, more involved than just rotating 13 characters. That's like the basics of encryption. And uh, there's uh, encryption with, like, you know, public keys and private keys. And, um, you know, it's, uh, the keys are ways that you encrypt and unencrypt. So you have to have a secret code to sort of, it's mathematical algorithms, right, which, you know, can encrypt. And then you have to have a certain key to pass into the mathematical algorithm to unencrypt it. That's kind of how that works. Uh, and piracy is the concept of stealing things which aren't yours, obviously, right? Pirates, that's what they do. Ho, ho, ho. Pirates' lives for me. Ho, ho, ho. That's like one of my favorite songs. Disney. But, right, the pirate, the pirate's life. Pirates, that's what they do is they steal stuff. So piracy... A lot, you know, software piracy, things like that. It's against the law, you know, to take other people's intellectual property that's normally being sold. You would think twice before walking out of Best Buy with a DVD or a CD, but a lot of times, hey, all right, cool, I could, you know, torrent, bit torrent it or whatever. Uh, we, you know, less likely to get caught. Why, why sweat it? Um, but anyhow, you should just be aware that that's illegal and, and, um, that's that's uh, piracy, movies, videos, music, software, right? Stealing things, um, yeah, piracy. Most so, of the time, that's the way to get hacked. You can watch a movie on the internet. Really? Yeah, that's the way every time I mess up. That's why I do a box of the latest movie I've seen. That's and, what I usually mess up. Yeah. And so then, so uh, you download the movie or whatever and run yeah, it, or you go to like a website and they'll say, I don't you know, know anything click about here that. To get there, and then you yeah. click here, and then, and then it just somewhere in there, click the wrong thing or something. And my friends were like, oh yeah, no big deal, but, yeah. And then your computer starts acting funny, or how do you know you were hacked? Because uh, it'll act funny, first of all, which is hard to tell me. It's like, really slow. <laughs> like something that got installed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, so uh, does anybody have any other things they want to contribute? No? You want to see the database deal? 
so you have a little bit of foundation just in class and can ask a couple questions. So let me go find that. You guys could uh, turn your computers on. Okay, I found it. That was actually pretty quick. So here's how relational databases work. Which, uh, who, who was uh, the last customer? Who was the first customer to rent? I don't know, First Blood. The first customer to rent First Blood. It's a puzzle. Raise your hand when you think you have the answer. The first customer to rent First Blood. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, who was it? Let me look. Three, three, four. Yes, Lalo. All right, so here's uh, here's what you do. All right, what's the ID for a movie? It's three, right? So movie ID three, and then that's in the movies table. So here's one table where I have all the information about movies. That's in the movies table. And then I come over here and I look in the rentals table, which is this one. Uh, what movie was rented, right? Rental ID, rental ID transaction, customer ID, movie ID. Well, here movie ID 3 was rented. And it was rented by customer ID 4. Right? And customer ID 4 is uh, Lalo. That's how you do it. So that's a uh, that's relational database. And you build databases, you build tables. And so tables just store, just group like information. They group like information. And so customers table, right? Movies table, rentals table. Where, where would I store customer phone number in which table? I know this is a totally obvious question, but where would customer phone number get stored? In the customers table, right? It would be first name, last name. So a database table is just you know made up with a bunch of records. So let's see if we can find one. Customer database table. Oh, that's really small. That's cool. So here's a clients table. And so each of these is a record, some client. And then we just store fields of information about each client, right? So here are their companies. So database is made up of tables. The table is made up of records. Records are made up of fields. And uh, fields are made up of characters. So we'd have like a customer's table, right? And then we have a movie's table. So if we wanted to store the rating of the movie, we could store the, just create another column here where rating is, and Die Hard would get R, American Beauty would get R, First Blood would get G, Cold Mountain would get F, Big Fish would get F, Alien would get A, G, R, whatever, right? How many people uh, see that? Raise your hand. You see how the different fields relate. So these IDs have to be unique for this to work, obviously. If we had two customers, four, that wouldn't make sense. All right? Whoa, that doesn't make sense anymore. So they have to be unique. So that, that hopefully will help you when you do the, you know, um, database assignment for your, your homework. All right. May you all be safe in the world. You guys have uh, the rest of class to work on whatever you'd like. I'm here to help you. Just let me know if you need some help.